Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the session on Dataport. Uh, my name is Rakesh Kumar. I chair the IEEE Data Strategy uh, Committee ad hoc, and, and I'm also a chair of the Dataport uh, Steering Committee. Uh, I'm honored to have with me Professor Vitol Kinsner. He's a very distinguished member of IEEE and the community. And uh, we will present to you, uh, I think, a very exciting uh, opportunity that could be useful both to students, graduate students, uh, as well as industry professionals. Um, so the plan today is to talk about data. I think we've all experienced data and how data is increasing very, very rapidly. And so, um, what we have, what we're going to share with you is uh, about Dataport as a platform that's been in development at IEEE for a number of years, and is really taking off. And and um, besides giving you a um, quick overview of where data is today, uh, I will talk in the context of a couple scenarios. One is if you're a researcher, and two if you're generating data, what do you do with it, and and show you how you can use um, Dataport to your benefit. So I can advance my slide. I think we've all uh, heard of ChatGPT or use ChatGPT and, and all the talk about how it, it gives you answers, good, bad, ugly, whatever. And, um, and yet what's happening is that that is creating a lot of data. It's also requiring a lot of horsepower and the computers that we work with. And so this chart is from TSMC, who is the leading provider, leading foundry in the world. Um, Kevin Zhang is the senior vice president there. And he presented at one of our conferences um, the escalation in the data. That's what I want you to notice here. Uh, another chart I will share with you is from Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of Intel. I think some of his numbers may be out of date because this is about two years old. Um, but also showing the escalation of the data that's being available. So apply it to your own scenario. Uh, if you drive a Tesla, for instance, Tesla generates a lot of data. We don't know what we what they do with it. Um, if you look at Google, there's tons of data that's being generated. So the bottom line is there is a lot of data being generated in the world. And um, this is showing the increase in, in requirements of the compute business. So that the semiconductor industries take care of that. Um, but let's turn to what if you were a researcher? Well, you probably have to make a, let me give you a simple model. You have to create a hypothesis of what your research is going to be about. And you are then going to um, figure out that you're going to set up an experiment, you're going to generate data, you're going <clears> to <throat> uh, build a model and, and uh, validate the model, and then you can do an IEEE publication. So that's a typical cycle. But what happens to the data? Um, is it shareable? How does one uh, find it? So those are the problems that, that you encounter. And, and so what I'll end up with showing you is that what if you were to have a place where you can store the data, find the data, you may not have to do as extensive an experiment. So that's how you accelerate your research, uh, what one possibility. Uh, let's look at another scenario where if you're in the industry, uh, you're working for Tesla, you're working for a lighting company, an energy company, a utility company, you're generating a lot of data. And I'll ask the same questions. What do you do with the data? What happens to it? Now, a lot of people have a perception that, oh, this is data, it's going to be so valuable, uh, I'm gonna to try to sell it. Well, you know, let me tell you, data by itself does not have any value. You've got to create solutions that make it valuable. So even the utility company that's generating data by itself, that's not that meaningful. You got to understand what the causes are, how the data was generated, um, and how it could be made useful. So this overall data strategy team that I've had the pleasure to lead at IEEE, uh, we have been looking at how to create uh, value out of data 
that comes from IEEE. IEEE has a lot of data, you know, at conferences, papers, technology trends, and all of that stuff, but we don't do much with it, okay? So that's the background context. And so many years ago, um, five years ago, actually, uh, Dataport was launched as a vehicle that could then have be a shareable uh, repository of information. So you could store the data. And, and to give you an example, if you were writing a publication, an IEEE publication, and the model that I showed you, if you're a researcher, you generate the data, you could upload it into Dataport and it could be available to other researchers who can uh, promote their own research. Um, we have since then uh, actually opened up the uh, data sets to be, if you're an open um, uh, environment, uh, you have, uh, anybody can upload data into Dataport and download. There's some business model differences that we may not want to get into today, but um, if you're an IEEE member, there's no problem uploading or downloading data. So what do you do with Dataport? You can store data in there. You get up to two terabytes per um, individual that's uh, uploading a data set. It gets shared. It gets, people can access it. You can also manage it in, in that the output could be a data management plan. And so you could say, well, why do I care about that? Well, if you were looking for funding from a funding agency like National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, uh, a lot of them. By the way, Dataport is one of the approved repositories at NIH. Um, but they are getting, they require uh, researchers and, and they get a grant to demonstrate that the data will be available, that the research is reproducible. And, and uh, that's the major interest that those um, agencies have. Now, from what I've heard is that they're rel they've been relatively lax in this, right? People say, well, I got a repository, I'm gonna share it, uh, I'm gonna store it, and I'm gonna share it if somebody wants to see it. Well, that's not good enough, right? They're getting a little uh, more demanding and they're trying to enforce this. We're actually trying to orchestrate a, um, a plan to discuss with them how to move forward with this. But Dataport is a, a resource that can then be used by you as a researcher when you're developing your research proposal to use the data plan, data management plan, uh, that's sort of an automated way that comes out of um, when you upload the data. So that's a real value for researchers. <clears throat> Where are we today? We have over seven and a half million global users. And this is a cumulative number over the five years. That's how many have used it. I'll show you the trend as well. And we have getting close to 6,000 data sets in about 30 or 40 categories of, of um, uh, that we categorize in terms of the disciplines. Um, so when you go to the website, IEEE-dataport.org, what you see is, is a home page that looks something like this. You can uh, look at the data sets that are in the inventory and the corpus. You can submit a data set. There are, of course, some rules you have to follow in terms of the metadata and provide an abstract of what you're actually uploading. Um, there are a lot of design competitions, and there'll be quite a bit of discussion today, uh, I know, uh, we told we'll focus on, on a classic competition that's very popular. Um, but there are, we've got a lot of competition data. So if there's a competition that um, uh, people organize, my chapter in HKN, you know, we do hackathons. Uh, I'm sure others do as well. If you're generating data that's usable by others, by all means, you can do this. Um, IEEE data port really is sort of an end-to-end -end it will help you organize the data. It'll manage the data. It'll manage uh, any prizes that you have. So there's a lot of things that um, we do. We're not promoting them as much. And so that's the effort this year is to uh, promote the use of Dataport. Um, we've been funded at, to a fairly large extent um, by IEEE to make this happen. Um, and then you can see in the, at the bottom here, you know, why Dataport, um, how to access them, how to submit it. Um, and how to subscribe them uh, to them. 
So what happens if you upload a data set, you get what's called a DOI number, a digital object identifier. Um, and you can uh, your, your data set is citable then. So somebody else that uses it, they can cite uh, this reference. So again, if you're um, an early faculty member looking for citations and um, recognition, this is very important. If you publish a paper, you can have a link from the data set to the paper and vice versa. So again, it, it helps you grow in the research field. So you can ask the question, what are the categories that are most popular? Um, and uh, unsurprisingly, you know, you would have artificial intelligence, you got 1300 data sets, uh, machine learning is, is pretty close and image processing uh, is another 600. So, um, and, and like I said, there's about 35, 38 to 39 categories. I forget exactly how many. So this is the trend, you know, the 24 number is an estimate, of course, and the 20, 21, 22 are actuals of, of how many people viewed the data from data port. So we're happy that, that this is uh, escalating rapidly. Our goal is to, to go even faster um, because there is a lot of interest uh, and, and it's not being cap, uh, capitalized on. So the next question you can ask is, well, um, what is the most popular content? Who accesses data the most? So here's some examples. The top three viewed data sets, temperature and speed control uh, in a lab, uh, almost 100,000 views, uh, weather monitoring station for farms and agriculture, uh, trilateration uh, based on RSSI values. I don't know what those are, but <laughs> for transmitters and receivers in the wireless field. So, it, you know, you, you could get a lot of visibility uh, for your data set. You can also ask the questions, which are the most viewed um, data competitions and so here's one that uh, was a phase energy meter uh, competition. We had uh, close to 400,000 views. Um, they had electricity demand forecasting um, post COVID paradigm close to 300. So data competitions are very, very popular. By the way, I don't have a chart on this, but last year there were about a million users from Bangladesh. And the year before there were about a million from India. So we are global there's a lot of interest worldwide i think the i don't know exactly why the um um you know what the bangladesh people are doing with this data but i'm guessing it is students answering design competitions or assignments that their professors give them and they're able to get data so uh, this is a tool that that is very worthwhile and uh, worth you checking out uh, let me give you a few examples before I hand it over to Vitol. Um, here's one, by the way, I, I think I downloaded this about two hours after it was uh, uploaded. And uh, it is about snow-covered urban road um, data set for computer vision applications. So um, it is a joint program between um, King Abdullah University in uh, Saudi Arabia and Montreal. The picture, of course, doesn't look like Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it's uh, more like Montreal. Um, but uh, important data set, I think uh, 44 views in an hour or two, I think is quite impressive. Um, next one I'll show you is a flame to fire detection and modeling. Uh, it's an aerial spectral image data set. Again, cooperation between the university research institute um, and, and uh, again, very useful stuff. Uh, next one is a competition that was actually sponsored by uh, Ersted as a, a corporation, a hybrid energy forecasting and trading competition. Uh, one thing we are starting discussions with in India, there is a, um, an organization called IUDX, is an in, uh, India Urban Data Exchange where they have all kinds of data, personal data for uh, agriculture data, for, you know, for the um, traffic data uh, and, and a number of other ones. And so uh, one of the things that we're exploring is, is uh, similar to the uh, computer vision and uh, uh, 
uh, traffic thing I showed you in uh, from Montreal, um, they are looking for forecasting and modeling. And the value that we IEEE can bring is to globalize uh, that data being made available to researchers around the globe. And so uh, it's not something that's been worked out yet, but we're working with them. I think I have a call scheduled with their CEO in, in the next hour or so. So anyway, uh, pretty exciting stuff that we're what we're doing here. Um, I will let Vitol talk about this, uh, the Extreme program. Uh, it's been going on for many years. Uh, what you can do is, if you participate, you can get help because all of the past uh, challenges from Extreme for the last 15, 17 years are now in Dataport. And what the experiences are uh, were for the participants uh, have been documented, and you can learn from those and boost your chances of being a winner. So keep that in mind. Uh, so to summarize then, so we have Dataport. It's a platform. And if you're generating data, you can now upload it into Dataport. You can use the data to do a research paper, which is the more common uh, activity. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to say that <clears throat> over 95% of IEEE publications are now integrated uh, with data ports. So what, what does that mean? When you go upload a paper, um, or you're trying to upload a paper, you're the author, you go through what's called the author portal <clears throat> at IEEE. Um, there you have a set of requirements, and then um, you get an option to upload your data set. So I would encourage those that are submitting papers to go use this. Um, there are a couple thousand data sets that are associated with papers. Um, and, and that's good. We'd like him, the number to be much higher. Uh, another thing that um, also you can also then download data from your uh, from data port. And remember the model I was talking about where you have a hypothesis, you're looking for data, and you create your own experiment. I would say the first place to look at is data port. If you find somebody's data and it's useful to you, it might help you reduce the amount of experimentation you got to do. Um, or, or adjust it accordingly um, and get to the end goal faster. That is what the uh, funding agencies are looking for, is use data from others that was useful and, and can be used by um, others to, to enhance the quality and the uh, progression of their research. Now, one other thing that we're doing um, that hasn't been publicized yet um, is that we have created a journal, uh, a publication called Data Descriptors, uh, Data Descriptions. And, and that, I think the first issue is coming out in June, so a month and a half away. Um, there, you would be able to not only upload your data to Dataport, but you can also write a four-page paper in a particular format. It's, it's not a typical IEEE publication. But what it does is give visibility to your data. Yes, I have to say that some um, publications like Nature and others have been doing this, and there's a lot of history that, that shows that this, this activity can be very powerful and very useful to researchers. So I'm glad we as IEEE have uh, the IEEE data port uh, and data strategy team were the drivers to make this happen, and um, we are thinking it's going to be a very successful publication. So that's an FYI. Now, if you have any questions, um, the program manager for this is Melissa Honda. Unfortunately, she could not be here, um, but there's a website, and you can certainly look at it. So at this time, I would invite, um, I'll quit sharing, and I'll invite we told uh, to uh, do his presentation. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving us the opportunity to actually talk about data. Data is the new gold. Uh, the data drive most of our developments now. Uh, we are capable of collecting data, unthinkable data. So, this is available. Um, Rakesh um, 
and various other individuals realized that perhaps adding data to the large collection of knowledge and uh, documents in IEEE would be a good idea. My focus today, so that already exists, and that is the data port, the IEEE data port. But now the utilization of it can go almost to an unlimited extent. For that, we need the new generation of individuals and the seasoned individuals who need it and know already a lot how to capitalize on that new gold, how to really utilize to discover new capabilities. Since our planet has been really moved to brings to some of the survivability, I think the extreme environments um, are critical now more than ever. So let's look now at the extreme student competitions, contests, and engagements that could lead to enhancement of our knowledge. Um, let's call it extreme engagements. So this, my portion of the talk, is how to link the two to create solutions that might not be available otherwise. If we, so what I want to really do is to, what the extreme engagement uh, is, why it is needed now, how <clears throat> this leads and engages experiential education into the classroom uh, and maybe even high schools and how that could lead to you, all of us, making a difference. Well, there will be two calls to action today. Um, and then the examples that I would like to also show is uh, the super extreme engagement uh, that we're doing in bringing the planet and low Earth orbit satellites. I'm leading that specific initiative, co-leading with a number of talented people. Then I would like to really show you how extreme programming contest in IEEE led to many, many interesting solutions. And then the 63 data um, competitions that do exist in various conferences and various places in IEEE. And the motivation is that really when we get engaged, engaged in such activities, um, that will be helpful in the new transformation that our jobs will not be just one in a lifetime, will be many. How to reorient ourselves. The second motivation was that last year, a very interesting paper indicated that those who are involved in such extremes and specifically extreme programming competition are four to six times better than chat GPT-4. Not two, not one, four. So that's where we are heading. So the reason for that specific extreme engagement are really multiple, but I will focus on the knowledge tsunami, then the number of people who are now on the planet, and then the transformation from one to many jobs where learning will not end at the graduation ceremony, but will start from that, that, that point on. This is the, the Bucky Fuller uh, diagram. He discovered very early that in the past it was okay to have all of the classes of learning. And uh, up to the point of 1770, where industry started playing a role, suddenly we, need to, we needed many, many people on assembly lines and the Prussian model of teaching and education was one fits all. Um, but that also industry and all of the science and engineering produce a rapid expansion, exponential expansion of knowledge. Um, today, we can't learn everything. We can't read more than 10 papers a day, uh, probably. Some of you may be 100, but I can't. And so we need some new approaches. Cognitive digital twins is of my interest, where super personalization will occur complex systems are addressed, that interacting systems will address, or can be addressed, transdisciplinary approaches can be implemented, and the experiential learning can be implemented. But what we need most of all is the black swans at all levels, because we already exceeded 8 billion people, 
and the jobs are no longer as it used to be. On the left side, this shows the duration of our job period. Um, this is the time. And you can see that the discrepancy between men and women was really uh, eliminated, but we still, the older generation goes through a one job. But the younger generation now goes through two to four jobs in a lifetime. How can we really accommodate that? So it cannot be just learning and then working. We have to really come together as a family of interacting individuals where the experience gained could be plowed back into the younger generation. And that specific component could be depicted over here. It's learning, 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 then gaining more and more experience, feeding that experience to people who don't have the experience. And then these arrows are one-sided over here, but surely enough, I learn from my students every day more than I could really learn from any book. The new ideas, the new challenges, new questions that are being posed. So that is where, where we are going. So the, my first call of action is be the the champion, make a difference in engineering, science, medicine, education, but above all, stewardship with all of that knowledge. Now, the um, extreme engagement that uh, is needed is because many things that we want to do, like real-time teleoperations, telepresence, cannot be done without good problem solvers. One of the examples is over here, telecommunications and telepresence. We obviously have been operating and developed fantastic terrestrial networks. And the networks, the internet exists because of that. The connection between also continents has been developed to a magnificent area. And also it's very fast, very broadband and can carry many bits at the same time. But people discovered that that was not good enough. We ought to put uh, devices and the transponders very far, far high up so that we could obviously communicate also in space. But in the older uh, things, the actual um, benefits were enormous in agriculture, buildings, cities, education, industry, lighting, uh, logistics, utilities. But the delay, the latency and the jitter was just too big to actually allow us to do it uh, in real time. We um, have to utilize now satellites, not only that go very far, but also much closer to the planet. This was a recent uh, level of satellites that exist. Um, um, this is uh, where I live. I see around four, 14 satellites at any time at the moment. Um, so this is moving story. It is no dynamic as this structure is. This is the um, uh, network that has been developed to rest, uh, uh, on, on the ground. We, we want to really link the two. As um, the other talks that you, you might have heard today from Sandra, the um, uh, astronaut, um, we now can do various things and the younger generation of people can be involved for a number of reasons. Um, the big expensive projects to put something into space has been altered around 20 years ago. Um, I established uh, in 2010 a group of 130 students from 16 departments with 60, 70 advisors. And we built, that's the first satellite that we built totally designed from ground up. I designed new torques. There, we developed a, a chamber over here to monitor revival of tardigrades in space to see how much radiation they can survive. These people, most of them are now leaders in uh, aerospace industry. Um, those individuals then led to change the world. There are now the extremes um, in our world. Um, this, these projects can continue, um, but in addition to the uh, structures that exist in space now, in CubeSats, I'm interested in femtosatellites, slice of bread, not just the bread, loaf of bread size of satellites, but smaller ones. But we need now develop a federated cognitive ground station ecosystem that exists in different, different forms, but is not sufficient. In order to develop that, we also are proposing research project contests 
for students in various universities and capstone projects and final year projects to be presented at conferences and then also at various specialized um, uh, schemes for industry and leading to startups. Um, we would recognize the individuals and there are many details that we could really, we don't have enough time to, to share today. But such extreme now engagement, extreme um, developments for extreme environments are possible because they are within the reach of any university, any college, and also uh, can lead, uh, can excite various students from high schools to join us too. So what I would like to say that all of that is possible because of the younger people, younger generation of individuals and the Eta Kappa new individuals, both young and, and seasoned, that realize that it is now possible to do that because of the networks, because of the data, because of the, the need and the changes that have occurred in the foundation of education. So we can really get there. One of the other um, well-established activities was the IEEE Extreme Programming Contest that started in two, 2006 by Marco Dolmer and, and various other individuals. This uh, contest um, is once a year, 24 hours, non-stop, um, where problems are distributed and have to be solved uh, by students. Those problems are evaluated for um, speed of solution, for memory use, for then elegance of solution in any language you wish. Normally, we use 34 lang computer languages to, to do so. So languages are not impeding factors over here, but it is the engagement and the preparation. Those individuals then can be recognized. The first prize is very, very high, going to the best conference on the planet. And, but this is the prestige uh, that exists behind it. In um, two, uh, two years ago, the number of participants was nearly 15,000. The number of teams teams exceeded 6,000 from 65 countries. Uh, 600, uh, nearly 700 student branches helped in that process and supported by over 700 ambassadors. So this is not just a minor process. It started from very few individuals, but now we have a massive operation and it is growing. But what is the most important over here is that there are now, in the latest things, is 750,000 solutions, uh, compilations that are submitted. There is gold in them in that. So uh, Rakesh and I have, and many others, have uh, encouraged the individuals to put the solutions on data port. They are available. And you can really use them to educate. I have around 20 slides also how you could really, how we could really help you develop a good extreme, how the extreme can be planned and the deep planning and preparations are needed to deliver it. I had students taken to a hospital because they thought that they could really solve any problem on the planet. And after the first one, they realized that it might not be true and their breathing stopped. So, um, those are the things that may happen. We have to avoid that. And then the other data, data sets that are available for everybody now are there are 63 competition data sets. Uh, many of them, as already Rakesh mentioned, are related to processing data for, some, for something that is of serious interest. And the techniques are focusing on signal processing. And signal processing also is image processing is involved, or even I've been involved in four-dimensional uh, signal processing, say it's the Doppler radar, where you want to predict some fundamental changes in the environment. 
Biomedical engineering is extremely strong over here, and that involves now fMRI and brain analysis to help individuals, and we are directly involved in that project, in such projects too, uh, individuals after stroke and after spinal surgery to recover their ability to walk, the, the ability to move their hands and start being functional. Environmental engineering, as you would expect, also has a large number of very good data, data that could be utilized. And surely enough, machine learning. But what I would want to say, uh, many people real, are realizing that data are profoundly dumb. And our various approaches, statistical approaches, um, separate the correlation from causality. I think we need the new people from Eda Kappa New and other places to bring not only the causality, uh, uh, the uh, statistical analysis, the correlation, but also why it happened, the causality, and when it happened. And surely enough, today when you look at the actual things and the networking done, uh, the data centers, the resolutions in time of milliseconds are already in the past. My former student developed an atomic clock on a board that can be plugged in any of your computer. And you can really uh, hope for sub-nanosecond resolutions in time. But is it really good for quantum computing? So those are some of the issues that I think that are standing in front of us. In order to look into more details. These are the 47 societies and councils in IEEE. Nearly all of them, nearly all of them have uh, competitions related to data. Many of them are posted already on the data port. That's the goal that I refer to. But remember, without you, those bits and bytes and zettabytes will be dormant and they are waiting for you. They're waiting for us to add that, to discover the value that they represent. And that specific component leads me to another call to action, to make the difference again in engineering, science, medicine, education, and the stewardship of the planet. Um, and in order to do that, you have to become one, an extrema an extrema that is not afraid of failure, but learns and is capable of learning from of the failures every day. And extremists who are not working to, to demonstrate how smart we are, but how good we are in, in collaborating and working together. If you look at the bridge, that's the beautiful publication of Eta Kappa Nu, you will see the examples where talented individuals, the extremists, as I call them, in around the globe, talk to their professors, not as people who mark their exams, but people who are mentors. Also join with all of the young professionals and seasoned professionals to have that networking that will be your strength. Yes, we are many, many of us are quite smart, but we're not smart enough to cope with the problems. Extremers think about extreme environments and the ex most extreme is our unity. I often say, I love oneness. The oneness that brings all of the languages that you see now in this slide together and will not this uh, separate us, but will bring us together. We have to find a common language that will allow us then, like the picture on the right now, to walk. There are many steps for us to walk, but we haven't started. We are not starting. We are starting uh, anew from each step. So this is the message that I would like to uh, pass to you. There is tremendous opportunity. The future depends on us, on you, and specifically the younger generation. Not be afraid. As there are many, a colleague of mine just published a book that quotes one of the persons say, the life is a very, very narrow bridge. The most important thing is to walk on that bridge and not to be afraid. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Vitol. Uh, very interesting. Um, so as far as moving forward, let me give you a little perspective on where Dataport is going. <clears throat> we are looking at the possibility of allowing data to be stored in the cloud, which it is today, but also to be able to compute in the cloud. Because a lot of the applications that we are dealing with, uh, we IEEE, uh, you know, GRSS, uh, I heard you just had a talk from GRSS people. Uh, they deal with data that comes from satellites, from, you know, pictures out of um, um, Ukraine. Uh, those databases are very, very large and very difficult to download to your um, device and, and do the computation. So that's the next generation of uh, data port that, that's being looked at. Uh, another comment I would say is I, I agree with we told about the data is a new gold. Uh, I'll tell you a little anecdote that people used to say data is the new oil. You know, oil was really um, a pervasive and, and uh, added value to industrialization. Well, oil gets extracted and used once and it's gone, right? Data, once you have it, can be reused many, many times. So that's kind of the fundamental uh, premise here. So let me share a couple of slides to wrap up here. Uh, I think what we've been able to show you is that we have an exciting um, platform that's uh, quite popular and lots of opportunities, like we told mentioned, uh, for researchers as well as industry people to use. Um, let me get my slide up. So if you ask the question, what does Dataport do for you? Well, you're able to store data um, up to two terabytes. Uh, you can meet the funding agency requirements, get a data management plan. Um, you can um, get global exposure for your research. By the way, I didn't mention, but there's about 15,000 new users every day uh, on Dataport. So one of the angles we're looking at is that's those are numbers that get started for interest to advertisers to come reach the users. And so someday we may get there. Um, you can participate in competitions. You can organize them. You can participate uh, extreme, like uh, Vitol made a case for become an extremer. And, and you can certainly leverage the data community uh, that's on here. So we're certainly excited. Um, we think there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, I forgot to mention that I have three layers of HKN on me. I have a pin. Uh, I'm a, a faculty advisor for the local chapter at um, Capasai at University of California in San Diego. Um, these kids are great. They're, uh, uh, they've been winning the chapter best chapter award for the last I don't know, umpteen years, I lost track of how many. But <laughs> So it's, it's been really exciting to be part of that uh, group and um, really glad to have had you here. So with that, I think we can open it up to questions. Uh, I know there was one question about uh, data security. If you're sharing data across nations um, globally, so I, would, I think that's a good question. In fact, that's one of the problems that we encounter with a lot of people, whether it's across national boundaries or not, but people are very protective of the data that they generate. Uh, there's also the concern of privacy. Uh, the assumption we make is that whoever uploads the data is taking care of those things. We do not look inside the data. We make sure it has all the components that you're looking for. Um, and, and so you follow, you have to follow those rules. But as far as the quality and the sensitivity of the data, uh, we don't really get into that. However, Rakesh, it is important to say that um, the uh, data should be secure in the first place, but we also, there are different levels of security. For example, uh, power systems, power grids, have to be protected. There are many, lots of data, lots of attacks. Um, pipelines have to be protected. Many uh, places have to be protected physically. So it's a cyber physical protection. And all of that is going on now by, there are many, many researchers very deeply involved. 
many patents in this area, many developments are happening. Yeah. And uh, the data um, have to be, um, uh, the actual identity of the data have to be protected too. There are different ways of doing it. Uh, if the question related to data security on the data port, we also uh, have different techniques. For example, my data set that uh, we posted related to uh, speech analysis in, in the, uh, for the purpose of speech typewriters, um, direct translation speech to, to things, requires some signature because if the data would be altered, um, would uh, then would rend be rendered invalid. Or not only that, if someone would like to repeat the research uh, and someone would alter the data, the, the research could be also rendered invalid. So we have, we, we are thinking and we can really provide fingerprinting of the data themselves that cannot be altered and it can be embedded so deeply through stenagrog, stenagrog, uh, yes. just hiding, uh, hiding the, the signatures <clears throat> that nobody could actually discover and change it. So there are different levels around five different classes of uh, security. All of them are on the table too. And if uh, this is also another area of research, how to protect the data and how to uh, make the data anonymous, how to clean the data from being recognized. So they're particularly important for all of the biomedical data. Thank you, Rico. Are there any other questions? I don't, let's see, let's scroll down the chat here. Um, somebody asked a question, if you find data to be invalid or very flawed, do you take it down? Um, I don't know exactly what we do, but in general, there's a star system. And usually if the data is be, going to be flawed, it's going to get like one star, right? And, and uh, I don't know what our rule is, whether we take it down or not. <laughs> I have to check with Melissa. But do you know? So I, I triple E has has a mechanism to uh, deal with that uh, related to papers. If papers is proven to be a for uh, an invalid for whatever reason, it can be. There is a process of removal. It. Okay. Any other questions? I know some of the people that have been in the chat. Thanks for coming and give us some feedback as to what you think of it. Uh, I think Nancy mentioned that the um, data port is in the expo hall as well. So you can go check that out. You got three more minutes. Anybody got questions? You're very welcome. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous. So thank you very much again for listening. And, and again, hopefully many of you, the younger generation, would be interested in becoming extremers. Yep. You are needed. Come join us. And Go now you have, the, you have the extra gold. You can mine it all the time and bring something good for the benefit of the planet too. Thank you. So there's a question here. Does the data have required uh, parameters? Uh, not really. There is a set of metadata that you have to upload with your particular experiment and your data. And that's the only requirement. Make it easy for somebody to use. And it is short description and, and <clears throat> right. uh, summaries and the results and the usefulness of it. Yep. And, and especially if you do a, a paper in the data descriptors, that will be more elaborate. Um, but um, like we told said, yes. Abstract, the metadata, and a description of what your experiment is. Thank you all for attending, and um, we hope to see you on Dataport. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.